Yeah, I guess we're sitting right at, let's see, we would have just passed five years. And we've come a long ways. Anabaptist Perspectives has come a long ways. Do you remember that time that I invited myself on a road trip with you? Well, I actually forgot about that. But now that I think about it, I'm pretty sure I never invited you along. You just kind of said, like, yeah, I told you I wanted to come with you. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, because you were invited to speak at a conference at the Bruderhof. Yeah, so random. I wonder, I still don't know to this day how they got my email, but for some reason they wanted me up at a missions conference they were doing in Farmington. New Meadow Run community, yeah, I think is what yeah. it's called. And that's like a long ways from where we lived at the time. Probably a 10 hour drive. Yeah, like in, so we were all the way down in Tennessee, Southern Tennessee, mm -hmm. and, and so I was just going up on my own. Mm -hmm. and apparently you had heard of the Broodhoff before. Right. I wasn't familiar with them really at all. Yeah. I'd read some of their books and I think I'd seen their YouTube channel, but I had never met them or seen one of their colonies. So when I heard that you were going, I naturally wanted to come along and see for myself. Part of their ethos is physical labor. So I don't know if you got in on this, but all of the attendees to the conference were given work to do. So they took okay. me across the road with a group to another Bruderhof and we made cookies. So no kidding. Yeah. I actually didn't, I did not know that part of the story. Well, meanwhile, I was on the other side back at the main conference area and they were showing me around, giving me the full tour and it was fascinating. And I was immediately struck by how much effort they put into communication of what they value and believe through publishing books, their magazine, Plow Magazine, um, and some other things. And I remember just almost right away thinking, wow, why is the my church tradition not doing something like this? Mm -hmm. Like we have stuff to share. Why aren't we publishing more books? Why why don't we have seminars and videos and things that are easy to find? I don't know, that kind of, yeah, it got me thinking that afternoon while you were off making cookies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also observed the same thing you did there at the back of the building where the conference was happening. They had a display table full of books that hmm. they were giving away for free. So I think both of us came away with a substantial stack of books. Oh, they, they like took me into the back and said, please take one of everything. So like I had, yeah. So we was, did. It was, yeah, I was like, well, okay then. <laughs> it's, it's high quality publications that they do. Absolutely, yeah, this isn't cheap stuff at all. And they're, and they're pretty widely read. And th that's the thing, they did a really good job with what they were producing. And again, I was just like, why, why don't I see this in, well, at that time we were going to the same church, you know, fairly, standard, I guess you could say, Mennonite church. Why don't we see more of this? And I think some of that was because you and I had been involved with helping produce some materials before this mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. in the Mennonite genre. But digital stuff. And mm -hmm. prior to the time that we went to the conference at the Bruderhof, I had been listening to their podcast. I forget what it was called. They discontinued it. Mm -hmm. They had a pretty high quality podcast going. They have an active YouTube channel still that they had going then. And so it felt like for me as an outsider, with no particular connection to the Bruderhof, if I wanted to know something about them, um, it was pretty obvious what I needed to do to learn about it. Just go to Google, go to YouTube, search for them, and they have plenty of material there where they present themselves very well, very artfully, and with a great deal of articulation to the onlooking world. Mm -hmm. But I think what impressed me was both the quality of that, but wishing that for our tradition, the moderately conservative Anabaptist, I wish that we would have some equivalent. Mm -hmm. Something that was easy to find. Because mm -hmm. I think an important part of this story is you and I both going to Sharon Mennonite Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. um, I Yeah, we were there together in, in their different times. And one of the things I did there is help them produce a video series, but it wasn't released on the internet. It was released in DVD format. Mm -hmm. In the end, you know, People saw it, but I but I wondered how much more reach we could have had if it had been readily accessible through a Google search or up on YouTube or or had a dedicated website for it. Um, which maybe one day they'll they'll do that. I, I don't know what their plans are with that project. Um, and just being like, oh, you know, this is going to be hard for someone to find mm -hmm. unless they literally like call up the school and ask for it. It's going to be difficult to find this material, and and that felt like that was um, representative of a lot of the material that mm -hmm. Mennonites and Anabaptists were putting out at the time. And remember, you know, this was five years ago. Some of that's changed. Wasn't this right around the time we did the uh, project with Dean Taylor as well? No, that was before. I think we did the project with Dean Taylor before. And I think that was where a lot of these things started coming together because we filmed a conference with him um, based on his book. 
and it was released as DVD and, and CD format. And it sold some copies, but it wasn't like a mind blowing amount of copies. But we also released it up on YouTube and it was totally different there. We got 10, 20,000 views on it. Um, and it was like, well, pretty sure we didn't sell 20,000 DVD sets. Like this is, this is amazing. Like, I don't know if people were just Googling it. I don't know how they found it because we didn't really advertise it at all. So I think all these things are kind of bouncing around in our heads when we're at the brood off. Exactly. Yeah. Then when we were traveling home, um, from Pennsylvania to Tennessee, it's probably about a 10 hour road trip. We were sitting in the car together, reflecting on these things. And we were talking about what we had seen from the Bruderhof. It turned out that neither you nor I had communicated to each other about it before, but we both had ideas in our head for how there was space on the internet for more accessible media um, by means of, I think podcasts is what we were thinking at the time, but the ideas of podcast and YouTube went very well together. Mm -hmm. And so we began to brainstorm and plan and make ideas for what it might look like for us to be involved in a podcast or YouTube channel that made the kinds of ideas that our churches represent accessible and easily available on the internet. Do you remember the spreadsheet? I do remember the spreadsheet, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was fun. So basically, I think I was driving for most of yeah. the trip back, right? And you whipped out your tablet and said, well, let's just start putting down mm -hmm. ideas of what we would produce if we were to do this. It was just totally brainstorming at this point, kind of more for the fun of it. But like, who would we interview? What what topics would we try to address? Because um, we were like, well, pretty clearly, like we don't know enough to, to do this ourselves. So we need to go and interview people. Instead of us having the answers, we go and ask questions mm -hmm. and and find answers from those who, who have invested and learned this stuff. Do you remember how many episodes we brainstormed on that trip? It was a, it was a lot. Somewhere between 80 and 100, I think. I forget exactly because we made most of the spreadsheet while we were driving, but then it evolved over time. But I think we started with about 80, maybe to 100 guests and topics in mind. <laughs> Whoa, that's kind of a lot. Which yeah. some of the ideas were good, some of them were very bad. <laughs> yeah, I remember there was a few of that spreadsheet that never got made. So if any that's anybody who's yeah interested in about perspectives, you know, there, there's the spreadsheet buried in the archives of a bunch of ideas that definitely got scrapped. But it was fun, and I think it got our our ideas kicking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when, when did we actually make the decision? Well, hey, let's just film some of these and just see what happens. Well, there was a process. Um, we got feedback from several people on the idea before we actually began to do anything. I think Kyle Stolzfus got involved pretty early on as your brother-in-law. I think mm -hmm. you probably emailed the spreadsheet to him or something and yeah. we gave him a chance for feedback. And from the people we spoke to, it was generally favorable feedback. So. Um, we didn't begin to film right away. There was a process that involved other people mm -hmm. encouraging it to happen. Yeah, because there was a number of months there where we didn't do that much with the idea, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Like we were chipping away on the background, like kind of trying to flesh it out, but we weren't like making stuff or producing anything. Because I was traveling a ton, like between October 2016 and like February 2017, I was basically gone the entire time. Mm -hmm. So I think it kind of sat on dormant for a few months, if I, if I remember so. right. But somewhere in there, we decided to go into production. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what caused that to happen. Do you remember? I don't remember exactly when we began to film the first episodes, but we had been talking about it before, and I think Matt Landis was the first one mm -hmm. we had to sit down for an interview, right? Yeah, July. I'm not sure why we did it in the summer. See, I, I, I wish we could kind of remember, like, what were the decisions going from idea to we're actually going to get some cameras and do this, which fortunately I had some camera gear from when I'd done some other projects. Um, pretty minimal, but we kind of slapsticked and duct taped and made it work. And then, yeah, I was just like cold emailing people. If I remember right, just like, hey, we're trying this thing where we go around and ask people questions and, and get it on camera and put it on YouTube. And we'd never done this before. We never posted anything and people were gracious enough to do it. Mm -hmm. And that was in the end of July in 2017, where we, the very first one was with Matt Landis. Which is interesting because Matt didn't know me at all and I didn't know him at all. Right. And I just, yeah, I just cold emailed the guys like, hey, I got your email from, I think it's probably Kyle or something at, at Faith Builders mm -hmm. connected us and said, you know, you don't know me, but uh, we're trying this thing. And would you be interested in doing an episode with us on Mennonites and technology? I was like, sure. So I came by his, his it was his old office and they've, they've since rebuilt the building. And uh, yeah, the first episode, it was kind of a mess, but hey, we we, we did it and it's up on our YouTube channel, if anybody wants to see it. But it was fun. I was like, wow, like 
this is kind of neat. I could, I could enjoy doing this. I get to ask interesting people, interesting questions, you know, what's not to love. But in that process, I think a big piece was the connections with that we had built through SMBI. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you remember anything specific about that? Cause a lot of that's kind of fuzzy. I don't remember a lot of the specifics. I know that at that point you were doing all the filming and for most of Anabaptist perspectives, you've done most of it, but mm -hmm. like a process has evolved over time to where we get other people involved. But at that point you were doing all the filming and I was doing a lot of the ideas and development of what we wanted to talk about by means of scripts or sets of questions that we would present to the guests, which would happen in Google Docs. Then we had Kyle at that point as an advisor and Chester Weaver was also involved oh, pretty early yeah. on. So we would make the set of questions and have our ideas and then we would send them to our advisors for feedback, which really did help to refine our plans so the advisors were important early on, but also you mentioned SMBI. A lot of our first episodes were with Cliff Strzok and Elijah Yoder, and I think Benjamin Good also from SMBI. So those connections you had with SMBI um, were pretty important mm -hmm. to the way we were able to film some of our early episodes. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure there's some old email threads from back then mm -hmm. where like after we mm -hmm. filmed with them, Cliff and Elijah and some of the teachers there said, oh, you know, here's a list of other people you could interview and here's like how to get a hold of them. Because like, how, how, who, who are we supposed to contact? You know, how do we find people's numbers? Because if you go back and look at those, what have we done? Like 140 something episodes now. I mean, there's a wide range of people we've interviewed. Mm -hmm. and it's just kind of random because we, you know, five years ago, we didn't really know any of them, mm -hmm. you know, outside of the teachers at SMBI that you and I had, had you know, been involved with kind of wild. Yeah. So some of it was just cold emailing people, mm -hmm. asking them to get involved. But some of it um, was the very important connections that you had at SMBI. Because mm -hmm. I don't know if season one would have happened the way it did. Or it would have been much more difficult if we didn't already have connections with people we mm -hmm. trusted who were willing to um, show up on our episodes. Yeah, because it's kind of like five years ago, mm -hmm. there wasn't, I mean, at least that we know of, Anabaptist, Mennonite, whatever, podcasts and YouTube channels like what we had mm -hmm. or like what we built. It just, it didn't really exist. At least not to the consistency that, that what we were aiming for every single week. You know, we were putting out a new video and a new podcast. And I remember the idea just feeling kind of alien. You know, we, well, nobody's ever done that. You know, will anybody even be interested in being interviewed? You know, mm -hmm. I was pretty, pretty sure people would just say, no, like this, we don't, I mean, this is, doesn't seem worth my time. I think we didn't have anybody say no to an interview in the first few years. I'm not sure, sure on that, but most people were saying, oh, we'll give it a try. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll see. Yeah, since then, plenty of people have declined requests for interviews, but early mm -hmm. on, we had an incredible amount of support and cooperation, even though we didn't know what we were doing at that point. Yeah, they knew we didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. It was pretty and they obvious. Had done it before. <laughs> but there was a lot of willingness to get involved and to help. Which is, yeah, which is pretty... That's pretty neat. So t to all those people who were on early episodes, I guess we owe them a thank you card or something for, for, for being willing to give it a try, you know, and being good sports. Cause like it could have flopped. It could have been a disaster. The whole thing could have just crashed and burned, but fortunately it didn't, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, around that same time, um, I went to Faith Builders like shortly after I had met, um, interviewed Matt Landis because I have family out there. And so my brother-in-law interviewed him. He's a teacher there and a few other people, a few other faculty he had helped line up. And it was around summer term, I think, uh, or something like that, because Chester Weaver had been there teaching. And Kyle, my brother-in-law, says, hey, you should meet this guy. And my, what, now my wife, but Trish was with me. I said, oh, yeah, I had one of his classes way back in the day at, at a Bible school or something. And so she kind of ish knew him. And we were like packed up walking out for at the end of the day after filming some people was late i was so tired we've been traveling like crazy and she sees him in the hall as he's like walking out and she quick flags him and i gotta tell you i did not want to meet him at that point i did not want to meet any more new people we had just interviewed however many people and i was tired and we've been traveling like for two weeks straight or something so he, he comes over and was very energetic and um, interested. And so, well, you know, wanted to hear about it. So I told him what we were trying to do with Anabaptist Perspectives. And he was immediately on board. Um, and Chester has been on board ever since. We've interviewed him a number of times. He's now a board member, quite involved in a number of ways. And he said, I'm going to fly you to Texas and, and have you meet some people out here. 
and maybe some people to interview and see if we can get funding for this thing because you can't do it for free because it's like cameras aren't free. My time, all these, you know, you, ha- you have to live somehow. At this point, I didn't really have a job. So he flew me out to Texas and we met some people. That's where we met Patrick Matthews for the first time. So he's been on the show a couple of times and here recently he helped us raise a bunch of money to upgrade our gear finally because we were using very old and extremely outdated uh, gear or we just lacking critical gear. And so he helped us get that and has been a big part of the process anyway. And while we were out there, Chester took me to meet someone from that community and pitched the idea to this person. And, and they were very interested in say, okay, how much do you need? And I had a proposal written up here. Here's how much money it will take to get this thing off the ground. They said, okay. And they thought about it for a day. And the day before I left, they handed me a check for the full amount. And, uh, that was the moment I think where it kind of went click and said, okay, this isn't just an idea. Someone's put a lot of money into this. Like it wasn't a small check. They put a lot of money into this and they believe that they think it's worth at least trying. And that was actually kind of scary at that mm-hmm. moment in time. Scary and humbling, but also very affirming. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. gave us the ambition to continue. And we did. Uh, I, don't, I can't even remember when it was I was in Texas, but sometime in that year, it, 2017 was yeah, like the It year. was before we published anything. So it was early on when we were still filming and collecting episodes for the first season. You know, I didn't even have, now that I think about it, I didn't even have like a sample to show this guy of what we were no. trying to do. Like it didn't exist yet, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh my, that's that's kind of wild. Mm-hmm. So that was most of 2017. Let's see, I'm trying to think, was there anything else that happened in that year? Yeah, that was the summer that the solar eclipse happened, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so we had pulled together somewhat of a team. We had a couple of advisors from other places. We had pulled in Brandon Nisley as a video editor and Myron Eby was involved somewhat at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Forget the extent to which either of them were involved. But I guess both of them were doing some editing work. And the solar eclipse was centered right over Tennessee where we were living. For that event, uh, several of the people who were involved from other places traveled and we all got together. So that was the first time I had met Brandon, the first time I met Myron. That was the first time you met some of them too, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Krista and Elliot came down for it. Um, Who else? Ryan was here. Like there's a number of those people I helped in those early, yeah, wow, that was fun. (laughs) Before that, Myron was just a Twitter connection. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I met Myron on Twitter, which is kind of awesome and kind of funny to think about in retrospect, because it's like, who is this guy? But he was like the only other Mennonite that I knew of that was making YouTube videos at the time because mm-hmm. I was making some YouTube videos of like my travels and stuff. I was like, wow, I'm not the only weirdo. Like this is, there's other people doing this, you know, because it felt kind of strange because I didn't know anybody else. Anyway, that was fun. That was a connection. This is an important, an important time for connecting. But also, do you remember that um, intro or about us video that we tried <laughs> to do that week? Yeah. That was a terrible disaster. I don't even remember. Did we have it outlined or I think we just kind of like made it up it was outlined was it yeah we just like sat down and tried to do that like it was supposed to be the opening up uh like video Mm -hmm. to launch the project yeah Yeah. and for some you know i don't know it just failed like totally i had never been behind a camera before so i was really bad at being in that situation we're also bright red and sunburned from oh yes from the solar yeah we were sitting outside all day looking at the sun so we were so burnt it was a disaster Uh, I forgot about that. Yes, it was a disaster. And that's kind of a proof, a, a, a point to be made that we did try a variety of things in when it, this thing was starting that totally flopped. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there was an early episode I had filmed that never got released, you know, because it just it just for various reasons just didn't work out. Like the guest wasn't as comfortable with it and I didn't really like how it turned out. And we're like, you know what, let's just scrap it. There was other little side projects we tried. It just failed. And so, yeah, that... that um, Video is supposed to be like the, here's what this project is video. Never made it past the editing room. And uh, so then it comes time to actually, we've collected enough content. Let's start releasing every week. But we didn't have a synopsis video that says, here's what this project is. Mm-hmm. So what did we do instead? Which I think was kind of weird, but. Uh, we did nothing. We just yeah. <laughs> went straight into publishing the first episode without comment. <laughs> yeah, we literally like upload, here it is, everybody, episode one. And we never really explained what the project was or like what we were trying to do, <laughs> which was very nerve wracking. And I remember it was at your house and we have footage of this somewhere. Yeah. That was a lunch party. Yes. Mm-hmm. And we had pizza. Yes, we did have pizza that day. <laughs> <laughs> but 
January 2018. So right at three years ago, because mm-hmm. we're filming this at the very end of 2021. Yeah, that was kind of weird because we just like randomly created a YouTube channel mm-hmm. and started putting stuff on it. And we we're like, will anybody watch? And after we published that first video, there was immediate response, but I don't think we should take credit for that because <laughs> we ourselves didn't do a lot of publicity. No, we didn't. I had never made a podcast before. I didn't know anything about how podcasts work or RSS feeds or any of that. So I was experimenting with SoundCloud and we happened to publish our first podcast episode. I think it was several days before our official launch day. That's hilarious. Which would be fine. <laughs> Theoretically, nobody would know to look for it um, or come across it before the official launch. But um, your sister, Rachel, um, from Daughters of Promise magazine, shared the podcast. I don't know how she found it, but somehow she found it. How did she find it? And she shared it on Facebook. And Rachel Stella, who was a journalist with Mennonite World Review at the time, saw it. And she reached out to us and um, asked for an interview. That is so right. So you and me, Samantha Trenkamp, Ryan Trenkamp, we got on a phone call with her mm-hmm. and she asked us a few questions and she published about us in Mennonite World Review. So automatically, without us even trying, we had people who knew about us. And I suppose the circulation of that publication is pretty broad. I, I, I guess. Because they, they published that article like within like a week, I'm going to say, mm-hmm. of when we hit upload on that first video. And the funny thing is, I got a paper copy of the Man at World Review then afterwards. Like it's like a newspaper. And we're on the front page. Now it's below the fold, to be fair, but it's still on the front page. And in my mind was just like what I was thinking to be this little blurb about that big on like page 42 or something. Nope, right there on the front mm-hmm. page giving our names and here's what you're trying to do because it's like we because she had interviewed us and stuff and that that kind of that really surprised me and it they they posted it to their facebook different ones on twitter picked it up and things and here we are and i mean the the response i think was pretty much immediate yeah we had an audience ready and waiting (laughs) which is pretty it's pretty wild oh yeah i forgot about this but anabaptist voice magazine also had a blurb about us Oh, I did that. Did, yeah. I didn't remember I, that. I, I did. I did just showed up one day. I guess I may found what we were doing interesting. So Mennonite World Review, January 12th, um, says many conservative Mennonites who have long been cautious about communication technologies are increasingly using the internet to connect with people who are interested in conservative Anabaptist belief. That's like the description. And then the title of the article is Podcasters Fill a, quote, Void on Conservative Anabaptism. Mennoworld.com. And right here it is, is the article. Anyway, that just kind of was like, what? Seeing this online. And yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Yeah. So for me, that added some weight to what we're doing just because of the sheer visibility. Mm -hmm. Like it was still felt experimental at this point, but instantly and somewhere or another, a lot of people were taking us seriously. Apparently. (laughs) Well, yeah, like um, the subscriber count on YouTube, we never promoted our YouTube channel at at, really at any point, Mm -hmm. but you could just see the subscriber count just doing this. I wonder if that would be the same today. In the current environment because at that point it really did feel like a void there were mm-hmm. not many people at all doing anything like this but in the past few years since that happened mm-hmm. many more have gotten into the same space mm-hmm. so with us being the first i wonder if there was a lot more attention because in some ways we were kind of trailblazing representing yeah. and reaching out to our particular demographic it's a really Just, good question. it was it was an interesting situation to be in with us being mm-hmm. some of the first but at the same time, there have been others that have come after. Like, I don't know, we think of like Daniel Willis. We've interviewed him a number of mm-hmm. times. And he started putting stuff up on YouTube. Soundfaith. Yeah, Soundfaith YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And it's doing very well. So the space isn't crowded for, for yeah, sure. definitely space for more. Yeah, like uh, there's a lot of room to keep pushing this kind of material. But I think it got it got things started and then more people start putting stuff out and then that just gets to eat out to even more people and more people and it just kind of grows and grows and grows instead of it being shares of a pie it's like the pie just keeps growing there's been a number of different podcasts that have started up since and that's been that's been really neat to see I've, i'm pretty sure we're not the ones who inspired any of them to start necessarily but maybe they maybe maybe it sparked interest or sparked an idea and we'd love to see more you know really like there, there's so. there's so much out there so what exactly were we trying to do because i know like our policy and organizational structure at that point wasn't very well defined, but we had some sort of a vision statement at that point. Yeah. Well, we didn't have a board initially. 
which is kind of a problem and has since changed. Good, good, good thing too, I suppose. I'm trying to remember how we even made this. I think you and I sat down and just wrote it out one day, but mm -hmm. dug it out of the archives. This is uh, this was the initial thing that we said. I guess we called it a purpose statement. Kind of kept it a bit broad. It's it's fairly um, ambiguous at some points, but this is the initial thing that we wrote. In response to the void of media that is representative of conservative and moderately conservative Anabaptist thought and lifestyle, we propose to, number one, describe and defend biblical elements of contemporary Anabaptist lifestyle. Number two, describe and defend Anabaptist theology. And then we went on to say, in response to the void of knowledge and interest in social issues of the surrounding culture among conservative and moderately conservative Anabaptist people, we propose to, number one, promote biblical discussions among Anabaptist people about social and cultural issues. Number two, provide non-Anabaptist people with ways to think about social and cultural issues that differ from the dominant media and news sources. This will be done by creating a video series for online format to be published on YouTube, Facebook, etc., thereby making it free and easily accessible for all. And I think initially the thought was we want to do this for our own people, like mm -hmm. uh, people within the Anabaptist world, and just make it super easy for anybody to find. But what surprised me, it still surprises me actually, is how many, just like the, it would be fascinating to know precise numbers, which we can't find because analytics aren't this good. But um, how many people are consuming our content that are not Anabaptist mm -hmm. or Mennonite or that stripe of Christianity at all? Um, but they've seen something here that's really interesting. They're like, hey, I want to know more. And so they're either, I don't know, Googling it or stumble on us because the YouTube al algorithm puts us up or something. It's, it's just been amazing the variety of people that have contacted us, um, which really wasn't a major focus, though it, it is in here. But it's just kind of something that just happened. Just because of our audience, by necessity, we've had to adjust a bit of the way we think about who we're reaching out to because like YouTube and podcasts is for everybody. And so you can't mm. perfectly pick who your audience will be. It's very, very rough. And it's difficult to know for sure. Like you said, mm. analytics don't tell us <laughs> what church affiliation a person has. But I think it's about 50-50. Half the people are in the churches we represent on our podcast and about half the people are um, from other places. Any Any idea how those people find it? Is it just they're interested in this and they search it and here we are. It's really, really hard to tell. It would be really interesting for people listening to the podcast to message us or email or something and, and say, here's how I found you. Because I, I, anytime I meet someone who said, I've listened to your podcast, it's it's amazing the different ways people have come across this stuff. And it's been really neat because we've gotten a lot of feedback from people that it's helped and helped them think about the world in new ways. And yeah, that's that's really encouraging. Because originally the, the thought had been, let's let's make a podcast. Oh, well, while we're making a podcast, let's go ahead and set up cameras and hit record so we can put it out on YouTube. And that was like the extent of what we had in mind. And we're like, we'll keep them short, put them out every week. Since then, it's kind of diversified right. a, a little bit. Well, we started with the blog, uh, which at first was basically transcripts, mm -hmm. edited transcripts of the videos. That's grown into something much different from where it started. Yeah, that's true. And that's been exciting, turning well, first off, a branding shift. Now it's called Essays for King Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so then they're making like high quality essays, not mm -hmm. just, not like your typical blogs, which tend to be kind of short. And we're, we're trying to go a little deeper. So hence essays. Substantive content. That's a, yes, that's a good way of saying it. And then more recently, taking those essays and narrating them as their own podcast stream. So Essays for King Jesus isn't just a section on the on our website now. It's its, its own podcast, mm -hmm. which I think is kind of neat. Yeah, yeah, I think most people or many people know us for what we now call the main channel, the main YouTube channel and podcast outlets. But there's uh, Essays for King Jesus is alive and well in both mm -hmm. podcast and blog. Mm -hmm. It's been amazing to see that grow. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the whole other podcast stream that is for the partners program and, and mm -hmm. also on, mm -hmm. on our Patreon page as well. That one's been really fun because that one's basically not exclusively, but but generally is the listeners submitting questions or, or mm -hmm. comments that we get on videos. And then we take a, a whole podcast episode. Gen it's usually just you, me, a few others Marlon. on staff. And occasionally we've had other guests on. There's about, I think, 80 people by now, right? Who are in our partner program or on Patreon supporting us financially. And which makes a big difference because uh, 
we're not exactly a for-profit company. No, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> we rely on generosity. Yeah, it's uh, the money. Yes, trying to sustain this financially is, is quite hard because we're giving everything away for free. We're not selling anything at all. The more it's shared and the more people who see it for free, the better is how we look at it. But the problem is you have to pay for the production costs somehow. It's an honor and it's a humbling to have so many people supporting us. Like you mentioned, um, when you went to Texas, the individual gave a substantial donation that helped us get off the ground. That was very humbling and affirming. But now, every month, every month, about 80 people have partnered with us to support us financially. And yeah. that's an honor and continuing, continuing to support us. Yeah, very humbling. And it also gives a sense that it's also helpful in the sense that it gives us the reassurance or something that, that we're on the right track in that it's helping people and people believe in it enough that they want to see it continue. That's the part that that has been has been kind of neat to see. Because some days you're like, well, is this actually helping anybody? Is this worth it? It's been a number of years. And we've come a long way since cruising down the interstate in my beat up old Buick Century car. Um, a lot has changed, but there's some a lot of things that have also stayed the same. With everything we've said, what what is it that keeps you still involved with this? Why do you still believe in, in what we're doing? Well, I still believe in Anabaptist perspectives because I still believe in the Anabaptist movement. I have enthusiasm about it since I find myself here. It's not that we want everybody to be Anabaptist, but this is where God has put me. And I think it's worth talking about the way that um, our tradition, people within our tradition, have chosen to represent the kingdom of God and to live it out. Since there's an opportunity to represent this on accessible media like YouTube and podcasts and our blog, I'm enthusiastic to be a part of that and help make that happen. I think it's kind of pretty much the same for me as well. I think the part that's been really interesting is is meeting our viewers in person. That has been a lot of fun. You know, people like, oh, I recognize you from, you know, I've seen, you know, I'll go to like a church or something and they'll say, I've seen some of your stuff on YouTube. Thank you. This has helped me think about the world in new ways. You know, I you, you brought more light into something because you interviewed someone who, whatever. That has been really neat to see. And if it helps a few people, let's keep doing it, you know? I'm sure some things have shifted and changed. We're clearly not the most qualified in the world to do this. You know, our, our gear, at least when we started, was was terrible. The quality wasn't great. Um, we didn't have the experience. But there's still a piece there that has shown us time and again that, that this is worth doing, you know? Uh, you respond to a lot of the audience comments and emails, and I think you get quite a few from all over the world, you know, of people who have found this and said, hey, this was helpful. Keep doing it. So I think we will. I don't think we're going anywhere. You know, I think this is this is something that's worth doing. It's a lot of work, but it's helping, you know, at least from what we're from the feedback we're receiving and from the amount of people that are engaging with the material. Yeah, it's, it's helping people and it's getting good information out there to people who may not have seen it otherwise. And, and that that's something to get excited about. 